Here we go. All right, guys. So today, um, today's going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to go through a case study of three athletes. These are not their actual times, just to keep it anonymous. Um, but it's it's three it's three situations I see a lot in sprinting. I usually get uh, one of these three types of athletes. Um, so we'll spend some time talking about that. Then we'll spend some time talking about a four week intervention of what we went over last week. So acceleration training. And then I want to spend some time going through some video breakdown uh, on some athletes. So looking at their first 10 and seeing the technical part of this equation and seeing how the improvements are made from there. Um, and then we'll spend more time on the question and answer today. And then if uh, Dylan comes on, we're going to do a little interview with Dylan. So we'll hop right in. So our, our main goal as I always say every week, is we want the world to view speed differently. Um, growing up, when I thought about speed training, I thought about a track coach having me run like two or 200s or 400s, or it was more distance-based training. And, you know, like I wasn't into it as a kid. Like I never did speed training until I was older. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions about kind of what we do based around the biases that people have um, according to their experience. So, what we want to do is we want to make speed easy, number one, and then we also want to make it fun. <clears throat> and then it's a lot more fun when you know you're going to get a result out of it. So a lot of times people go through a speed training program and they go through for two months and then they come out of it with little or no change. So uh, that could be frustrating and it could turn people off. So what we want to do is kind of create a standard based around what speed training is, um, how it's done simply, and um, how we can have some fun with it. Um, so we want to, I honestly think we could change lives with this and I, I've seen it happen. We've seen, you know, over 150 college scholarships. We've seen guys go to the NFL. We've seen people realize their Olympic dreams. <clears throat> so I think it, it definitely changes lives, but also it gives us a chance to be able to contact these people and, and talk to them in person and, you know, you know, a lot of times athletes will tell me like, hey, I'm going through something, you know, can you help me? And, you know, honestly, like speed has been a, a way for us just to level the playing field for us to have these conversations and help more people um, on top of actually changing their performance. So last week we talked about what if we combine technical training with physiological science? So what if we took the technical components that we all see on Instagram and you know, YouTube and everyone's talking about technique, technique, technique. But what if we combine that with the actual physical program that improves the capabilities and improves the capacities for athletes? Um, so that's what we'll get into a little bit today. And, and truthfully, this is, this is the method that we've been using all year. And what we did is the beginning of the year was heavily focused on technique. And then when COVID hit, we weren't able to see a lot of the guys in person so we tested them before they left, um, you know, go back home. We gave them a program, and then we tested them when they got back. We actually saw a bigger change in the time period they were away than when they were with us. And that doesn't mean that we were bad coaches. It means that we were focused on the things that weren't going to create the biggest uh, change. So the, the, we, weren't gonna, we weren't focused on the things that have the highest amount of change. Like, for example, um, their force, their velocity, or changing their power. Um, it wasn't always just a technical start. Like we spent a lot of time teaching them, you know, how to get in your stance, how to drive out, how to take your first four steps. What we saw when we had um, everyone go home is that a lot of those things changed as we changed their profile um, to develop more power. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, a lot of you guys, if you've been following me, know about the 20 hill challenge, uh, something that I started in 2017. And the reason why I started it was I was talking to my friend, uh, Jeff, who won a gold, gold medal at the Olympics. And I was like, Jeff, like, how are you so good? So young? Like, what did you do? He was like, man, I grew up super poor and, uh, didn't really have trainers or anything like that. But every day I would run 20 hills every single day. 
I was like, 20? He's like, why 20? He's like, well, like 10 was too easy. 15 was like medium. 20 was hard enough. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So this is at a point where I'm like 2017. I was um, 28. Like my athletic career was over and I was just like trying to get in shape. So what I did was I ran 20 hills every day for, I think it was like 40 days, 42 days, somewhere around there. And like, I, you know, I ran, I ran them hard, but I wasn't trying to kill myself, but just having fun with it. Um, you know, then it became kind of like a community thing where we had everybody in our gym going. Then it was like the whole city was going. And then it was like thousands of people were tagging 20 Hill Challenge and like all around the world. So it ended up being this pretty cool social movement. And we attached some like, you know, whatever was happening at the time. Like, I think there was a lot of gang violence in the city. So that, that became our focus. And, and pushing awareness for that. But the cool thing is at the end of it, I ran a 40. So when I started out like full transparency, like this is embarrassing, but I'm gonna tell you, I ran a five flat 40. Like I, I had not been lifting, I had not been running. Like I was just kind of hanging out, you know, eating bad, enjoying being 28. By the end of this period, no lie, I ran a four, four, seven, 40. Um, part of that is because like I am, technically trained like I had you know I ran track in college like I know I teach technique so I was able to um, run faster plus my body fat percentage went from like 20 to like 10 <laughs> so part of it's that but um, I never understood why I truthfully never understood why like I always thought it was maybe it was my body fat maybe it was like frequency of training whatever it was but what I realized um, now as I'm going through a lot of the data stuff and you know, we're working on our algorithm and things like that. I realized what I was doing was I was training my body to produce more horizontal power. So when I was in college, uh, coming out of college, I ran a 4.7. And then after college, I ran a 4.47. Uh, so exact same time when I was 22 years old. And, you know, I, in college, I was squatting 585. I was super strong. But I couldn't translate my power in the horizontal plane. So I ended up being average until I started doing more resisted work and working on technique. So what I'd realized is like, okay, when I was doing these hills, it was a simple way for me to produce horizontal power and practice what it looked like to continue to try to hit back, hit back, hit back. So um, this is, this is now like, if you go on the app, like 20 hills is on every week in the app pretty much until like week 12. So I love hills. And if, it's the lowest hanging fruit to improve your speed because it's going to be at a low velocity, but it's going to be high force. So you're not going to get hurt. Um, and it's an easy way to do it. But I thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, try to share a little bit each time about, um, you know, some of my story, but this was, this was a fun time. This is war park, by the way, in San Diego, if you ever want to pull up. All right. So on our agenda, we're going to go through uh, three case studies from uh, this week that I put on Instagram. Uh, we're gonna review last week slightly, and then we'll discuss um, what a four-week intervention looks like, um, or, or what the changes look like in a four-week intervention, and then question and answer from there. All right, so um, what did you guys choose on this one? Just put it in the chat, like A, B, or C. What did you guys choose? Don't be shy. Okay, so some people, some people DM me and said they, cho they chose A. So A has the highest velocity, but if you see, it takes them 5.51 seconds. So remember our equation from last week, peak velocity minus initial velocity divided by time equals our acceleration rate. So let's say all these athletes play football. Athlete A can hit 22.5. Athlete B can hit 22.3. Athlete C can hit 22. But what happens is if you look at game, game situations, the majority of plays in football and soccer and rugby are within a 20-yard uh, limit, So, which means that their speeds that they reach, they reach within 20 yards, or the play is only 20 yards long max. Anything over 20 yards is considered like a breakout 
Um, and it's far less likely to happen in a game, although they do, but it's far less likely. So in order to, number one, make an NFL team or high high level college team um, or move on and be good, you would need to have an efficient acceleration to access your speed earlier. So think about a running back. If a running back has a top speed of 22.5, but it takes him 5.51 seconds to get there, when he's breaking through the hole, it's going to take him a longer time to get to speed, which means he's probably going to be caught by people that don't have the high velocity capabilities, but have a good acceleration capability. So having an Excel capability for running back is huge. Um, then you look at athlete B, like he's somewhere in the middle, like 22.3 and 4.96 seconds is pretty, pretty good. Honestly. Um, you see a lot of receivers built like this where they have like a little bit of a longer speed capability where they run a little bit longer routes on the outside. Um, you know, some, some safeties are like that or, but truthfully, like the higher the accelerate, the better, as long as that velocity is the same. And then C, you have 22 miles per hour in 4.24 seconds. So just think about this. Like, if they were all running a 40, athlete C is the only athlete in this group that would hit their peak velocity in a 40, which means they're accelerating the entire time, and there's, like, hardly any deceleration period. Because you, let's say he ran a 4.4 or a 4.5, it would, it's a fraction of a second that he would um, be decelerating, and it probably wouldn't be very much. So athlete C is the only athlete that would hit top speed in a 40-yard dash. Uh, also, in a game situation, if he can hit 22 and 4.4, in one second, he can probably hit 60% of that or more. So if an athlete like him were to break through the hole like a running back, and, um, you know, in one second, think about how much, you know, horizontal force he, he's using, he can get – he can get some speed going within that one second. Um, you guys have any questions on that? Just drop it, drop it in the chat because I'm gonna keep moving. So, how would we improve this? So, let's say we have these these three athletes. What is the difference in their programming that would get them all to have a higher acceleration rate while keeping their peak velocity? So, let me uh, let me switch this real quick. <laughs> Why did Dylan Dylan chose D? <laughs> Very inappropriate. Um, here we go. Okay, so this is uh, this is Cameron Jossie's data, um, and the reason why I used his is so there's no bias in this, <laughs> and um, he did a good job. So F zero we talked about being max horizontal force. So you look at athlete one. Um, pretty high, athlete two, extremely high. Uh, these are changes from week one to week four. So from week one he, to week four, he had a 5.5% change. Okay, then you look at V0, you see the change. You look at max horizontal power, you see the change, then you see the split times. So what I'll do first is we'll go through each athlete and then we'll break down uh, what changed and what we focused on during that period. So athlete one, his horizontal force increased by 5.5 and his max velocity only increased by 0.11%. So it's a very, very, very small increase, like probably not even a mile per hour, just very, very, very minimal. But if you notice on athlete one, his, his maximal power was up by 5.56%. So think about force and velocity equals power, right? So his power increased, even though his velocity didn't increase. So let's see what it did to his 40. Over 10 yards, there's a 0 0.06 second change. Over 20 yards, there's a 0 0.09 second change. And over 40 yards, there's a 0.33 second change. So 6.36% change overall. So massive change, 0.33 seconds. That's four weeks. Um, no technical training, just using the, the sled loading that I told you guys about. Um, and then a couple of velocity runs. Okay, athlete two. So the first two athletes are very, um, their velocity is good, but they're force deficient. So what we worked on was developing their force. So athlete two, 9.72% increase in four weeks in max horizontal force. 
um, 1.1, sorry, 0.118% increase in V0, max, theoretical, theoretical max velocity. So very, very, very minimal again, not even, not even a mile per hour. He had a 9.76% increase in max horizontal power, which is massive. Uh, over 10 yards, that equated to a 0.1% uh, difference, 0.1 second difference. Over 20 yards, barely any change. Overall, a 0.24 second change. Okay, it's a 4.88% change. Uh, athlete three uh, uh, wasn't able to retest. So athlete three, you see, he was extremely strong and force dominant already, but might have lacked some velocity. Okay, so his program was focused on maintaining his force, but increasing his velocity. So doing some more velocity runs, some lighter sleds. So 0.727% increase in max horizontal force. You see a bigger jump in the max velocity, 2.712%. So that's, uh, it's, a, it's a good amount. And you see his total increase in horizontal power, 3.336. Probably would have seen about a 0 0.2, 0 0.15 second difference um, in that. Uh, athlete four, same thing. They're force dominant already, velocity deficient. You see a big increase in their velocity, so 4.12%. Max power jumps up 5.18%. Not much change in the 10, not much change in the 20. Uh, you'll see a bigger change in the max velocity. So each of those splits from 30 and 40 would be about 0 0.04. So he'd have a 0.1 second difference, like a 2%, 2%. So you see a lot of the changes. Um, the, if they're, if they're coming from force here, like these are big changes and they happen a lot faster. These are pretty incredible changes because you actually, 4% is kind of high from what I'd see. I usually see one to 3% change in max velocity or zero to 3% change in max velocity, but you can have a massive up to 10% change in horizontal force. Okay. So, um, this is, this is just based on individual loads. So it's, it's finding the right power equation to make each athlete better. If we were to look at all these athletes and give them the same program, we would probably see half of them get better and half of them get worse, honestly. Because you look at, you know, if we did a velocity only program, athlete one and athlete two would not improve, while athlete three and athlete four would improve. And if we did a force-based program, athlete one and two would improve, athletes three and four may not improve, okay? So that's just a, a cool case study Cameron Jossie did. Um, and this is without any technical, any technical training. Um, so I'm going to pause there for a second and I'm going to see if Dylan has any questions. Uh, so you guys know Dylan is one of my partners and uh, he's an incredible speed coach. We got him back in San Diego and I'm actually in the process of teaching him a lot of this stuff. So it's, um, we're just going to like do a live thing because whatever questions he has, you guys probably have too. So I'm going to unmute Dylan and see what he has for us. Yo, so how do you take body weight into account when looking at total force and total power and how does that come into play in your, in your calculations? Okay. So for, you're saying how do, how do we, um, how do we look at this data in relation to body weight? Yes. That's a good question. So um, that's not the right one. Okay. So if you guys look at this sheet here, uh, if you look at the F0 number, so you see it's a very, very, very high number, right? Then you look next to it, F0 norm. F0 norm is normalized to body weight. So that means if, he, if they're producing like uh, one, uh, Max, Kate Stewart, 801, um, the F0 norm, because her, her body weight was super low, ends up being 7.63. So that's the way to normalize it. So you look at a 300 pounder, you look at a 160 pounder, um, we're looking at per unit of body weight. So how much force are they producing per unit of body weight? Does that make sense? Yep. Oh, what, what else you got, Dale? That was a good one. And how are you calculating 
how much resistance to put, and then does it alter on different days or different distances in the sprint, and is it individualized? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question. So I'm going to go to what we talked about last week on this one. Um, let me pull it up real quick. So everything is based around the 50% velocity decrement equation. So it's about building out can, – can you see my screen, Dylan? Yes. Okay, so it's about building out a profile so we know where all the athletes are, like velocity-wise, and then finding um, where their peak power lies. And that's 50% V0. So that's just one of these sheets, and it's not super crazy to do, um, but finding the optimal load. So if you look at – if you look at data and you look at, uh, like, okay, I – I don't have the ability to do an optimal load sheet. You would assume that everybody's optimal load is going to be within, within 60 to 95% of their body mass. So anywhere in that range. And if you get, if you look at like the better the athlete, the closer it is to like the higher. So like um, most of the athletes will be like 70 to like 85% body weight. So it's super in relation to what we're, we're used to. It's actually extremely heavy. So it's a lot heavier uh, percentage according to body weight than, than normal. Um, there are some articles that came out a couple years ago that said you should only have a 10% body mass sled um, to improve speed. But what the actual study was about was about um, does 10% or what percentage body weight doesn't affect the kinematic changes in sprinting. So like if I were to, if I were to run with the sled heavier than 10%, it's going to change the way I sprint while using that sled. So they're saying you don't want to change the way that an athlete runs by putting a heavier sled on, but that's not true. It's just like, um, it's like doing a heavy squat. You know, you, it's not going to be as fast and have the same velocity as a squat jump, but we're building the capacity to produce more power by building that force up to building that strength up. So it's the same thing with, with, with sprinting. It doesn't have to technically be great because um, and while you're pulling a sled at 50% uh, decrement, you're going to be, or, or 60 to 90% body weight, you're going to be using almost maximal force into the ground every step. So, or you will be using maximal force into the ground. So that's, that's really the goal. It's not, it's not a technical thing. This is a physiological thing. So it's improving your physiological ability to produce power, and that's the benefit of it? Yeah, to produce force. So it's working on the force side of it, and then, uh, um, yeah, exactly. And that algorithm equation you just pulled up already factors in where that person is individually on the force velocity curve, so it's already individualized based on their, their algorithm you just put in? Exactly, yeah, so everyone's is individualized, but like if, if you're looking for something simple, it's like 60 to 90. But what, what we did is like when you do that load velocity sheet, you plot what your speed is with 25% body weight, 50% body weight, 75% body weight. So then it, it gives you like um, an optimal power range for you to train at. Um, but pretty much everyone's going to be around the ranges I just gave. So does that make sense? Yep. And another question, do you think there's a slight – self-correcting or technical improvement in horizontal push just by having the sled where maybe there's no coaching cues but your brain has to figure it out for itself when there's a sled yeah exactly and that's that's actually the, the key of, of everything that i'm saying so like um that's that's a really good point so you're gonna see a lot of technical changes happen as the power improves and then you also see technical changes happen because it puts the athlete in the environment where they have to push, they have to push the ground behind them uh, in order to go forward. It's just like pushing a car. If you want that car and it's in neutral, you want that car to go forward, then you're going to have to push the ground behind you. You're going to have to put your body angle at the right angle. So you're, you're actually changing your mechanics by forcing your body to be in that, in that environment for a longer period of time. And when I first met you a few years ago, if it was a five, 10 yard weighted sprint, it would be super heavy. Transition would be a little lighter. And if you were going for some top speed, it would be like almost 10% or tiny. Do you still decrease it depending on the region you're trying to work on? It's just more within this framework of your yeah, free test? Yeah, definitely. 
definitely. So um, you definitely will decrease it. So like if you, we talked about last week is that DRF number, um, this equation here. So anything over 10 is not good. Um, closer you can get to seven is like good, seven or eight. So which means that you have the ability to accelerate um, pretty much every five yards or 10 yards until the finish. So if you improve the DRF number, it means you have more net horizontal force as the velocities increase. So you're basically accelerating more because you have the horizontal force. So um, the initial thing you wanna do is you wanna have a high ratio of force, which means you wanna have a high horizontal component to what you're doing, right? Then second is you wanna keep that horizontal component for longer so that it decreases slower. So lighter sleds, like, um, medium to light um, percentage sleds are going to improve the later parts of the run. So yeah, I think we, we still do that. It's just keying in on um, what's first. So if we only improved the ratio of force and the peak power, yes, there will be an increase um, in speed and there will be a decrease in split times. Now, if we look at let's do uh, ratio of force and the DRF, and let's improve the power. And let's look at later on in the race or later on in the run, like how to improve that because we have a longer window of time. Now you're, you're talking about, you're gonna see even bigger increase in, uh, in velocity and decrease in split times. Yeah. And in the DRF, so the people who can't hold their top speed very long, yeah. are, where's your percentage at now? Are you still? trying to emphasize more physiological change or that's probably a mechanical breakdown if they can't hold it yeah if they can't hold it i mean there's there's two parts to that there's like it's a stiffness equation so like you're looking at how much stiffness are they creating on the ground so that would be like more on the technical side so looking at their contacts and all of that and, and where are they breaking down so if they're um not holding it that means they're decelerating early which is probably something technical um because once, once you get up to velocity, then it's no longer about re-accelerating to, to maintain it. It's more about having the technical ability to keep everything landing closer to the center of gravity and maintain that velocity. Um, so yeah, I think that would be on, more on the technical side for sure. And you gave the great example of the running back, maybe D linemen, forwards in rugby, how the acceleration rate is really what we're focusing on. Yeah. on these sport athletes, but say you got hired to work with someone who runs 200 meter, 100 meter, or maybe he's a home run hitter in a team sport. Does your emphasis change a little? Yeah, I think so. So like if we go back to, oh, I'm on the wrong one. Um, if we go back to this year, so for athlete A would be a better 100 meter, 200 meter runner than athlete C because they have a acceleration that continues to climb their velocity higher. Athlete C would get to their velocity at about 40, you know, close to 40 meters and then probably only be able to hold it to 60 and then decelerate. So they might be, athlete C might win a 60, um, 40 or 60, you know, and athlete B might be athlete C to a 80. But athlete A to 100 would win because um, their, their, their acceleration is longer. They reach a higher velocity, which means towards the end of the race, they'll decelerate less in, in a, like, perfect scenario, obviously. Like, they could, they could stop running you know, and, not, and not have that change. But, um, yeah, so I think you look at this demands per sport and you look at um, a baseball player, for example, like, I still think they would have a have to have a great acceleration rate, but there might be a couple guys out there that need to have a higher velocity to go and get that long ball. Um, I don't really know how like how far they would need to run, truthfully. Um, but yeah, that that could happen. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that was pretty good. I liked it. Yeah. And home run hitter, I meant like Marquise Goodwin, Perry Baker, but I know what you mean. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's like. Oh, that's a good one. It's like Perry, Perry versus Carlin. Like Perry's got a really high velocity and a okay acceleration rate. Carlin has both. Carlin has a crazy acceleration rate 
and a crazy high velocity. So he's kind of a freak. But um, if you look at beating somebody within a 10 meter square, Carlin has that ability to turn the jets on and have get up to velocity extremely fast. Um, Perry's improved a lot over the past couple of years. He's gone from like a three acceleration rate to like a four, a high four. So um, definitely would, Im would, would improve that a lot. Yeah. You got anything yeah, else to But someone like Perry Baker two years ago, that three on the acceleration rate would have looked alarming, but it was really just because his velocity was so high. It was kind right. of, it didn't tell the whole story. Yeah, exactly. Because he, his, his velocity was so much higher than everyone else in the field that like, it didn't, it didn't matter. Like it wasn't, we're not talking about like track where it comes down to split times. Like he could, he could still accelerate past everyone and he's, he's still improving that. So yeah, I agree. Uh, that, that pretty much covers it all. I, I'm wondering, would you take sleds away one week before the combine or one week before season, or is there a, a cyclical or deload where you think that it stresses you too much on the nervous yeah, system? Yeah, so that's, that's what uh, we've been playing around with. And the, the answer is, truthfully, is that it's just like, it's just like maximal strength. So, um, I would deload in terms of in terms of how much velocity we might be doing. So like um, on the unweighted runs and things like that. But as far as this is like primarily concentric, it's not a lot of eccentric stress on the body. Um, it's not a super high velocity. So maybe it's just eliminating a, a few sets or a few reps. Um, so maybe instead of doing four, it's one or two, just to prime the body. And keep it and keep it going but um if you look at for example like let's take a sport like football where they play every sunday so they play every sunday for 17 to 20 something weeks um you wouldn't take out this mid-season because they're like oh we need to recover you would keep it because you want to keep them having the ability to produce force and actually maintain or, or increase their force abilities throughout the season because if they're running at a high velocity but they start to lose their ability to put force um, have a high horizontal force in the beginning you're exposing them to more injuries so keeping that keeping that alive is is, is really key for a combine scenario um, this year we actually what we did for pro day is if they had a pro day on Saturday their last uh, run weighted run was on Tuesday and it was two reps so we kept it in there yeah and when we were looking at the data of when an athlete sprints without um, without a sled when it's just body weight sprint yeah how their power peaks at one second because of how forceful the drive phase is yeah and then the peak power goes down a lot at least horizontal power because of how fast they're moving then, and there's no longer a drive. So your hills and your sleds get to elongate. So the entire rep on the hill or the sled, you get to replicate that peak power phase that you have at that one second instant in a sprint. Yeah. So that, that's what looks cool to me. Yeah, exactly. No, that's exactly the entire point. Yeah, 100%. That makes it, that's the simple, simplest way to put it. Yeah. Um, was there any like questions in the chat you could come through? Oh, do I do we pull this data from Nick Lloyd? Yeah, so like the velocity data we do and the Excel Excel Max data we do, um, and then we're working on something that make it even simpler. Um, oh, you so see, you might have missed from our earlier presentation. How are you calculating horizontal force? So that's just from a force velocity profile. There's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, one is just inputting split times into a spreadsheet. One is, um, you know, using data from a radar gun or GPS. But I can, that's like a whole separate um, talk, Steven. So um, we're just kind of going through like what, what you do when you see it, but the, calculating the force velocity is like a whole process. So I, I'll, I'll start to go into that probably a little bit later. Um, still, you still on here? 
I can hear you. Okay, cool. So let's go through a couple um, technical things that we would that we would do um, with the athlete. So I'll go through Cedric, JJ, Miles, and Nick. We'll go through four, and then we'll talk about just like from a human eye, like what we see from a phys physiolog physiological standpoint first, and then technical second. So I'll play them all in slow mo. Can you see it? Yeah, it's freeze framed right now. So what would you see like from that? How do you think their ratio of force is first? Like, how do you, do you think they're horizontal or are they more vertical on this one? Who are you asking? I'm asking you. Compared to later in the race or compared to other athletes in the beginning? Um, just compared to him. So it's, you, know, you think he's got a good horizontal push here? Coming out the start, yes. And then he keeps reaching in front of himself a little bit. Yeah. So, like, the way that we would read this on the force velocity, would they, he would have a great initial ratio, and then he would have a very fast decrease in, in force, right? Does that make sense? So he would his would decrease really fast. So, Dylan, you know this really well. So why, why would it decrease from a technical standpoint? Because he's not attacking backwards. There's no backwards push. So if the shin angle's too high or the foot's traveling forward, heel strike, it's a little bit of a vertical component too soon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like if, if we go back and we look at step one, first thing I see is that right foot doesn't push that much and it flicks up. So when it comes up, it ends up being super short. So we talked about like this year, a lot of those guys were reaching their back foot around that first step, their first uh, first yard line. You see them kind of crashing into the ground here. Doesn't really produce much much power coming out. Like he's not getting very far. And then you see on step two and three. So step two, which way is this traveling? Traveling you said forward. which way is his foot traveling? Yeah. Yeah, then it's traveling forward. Yeah. So even though his body's at a, like his long axis from his heel to his head is a good angle, if you look at this angle, he's really producing force up. He's just kind of bent over. Yeah. So decent push, not great, but then it, quickly decreases because of some technical changes. Um, let's look at Miles Bryant. And I'll, I'll tell a story about Miles after this. You see the cutter in the back, Dill? <laughs> With the green shoes? Coach Tap. Yeah. What do you think? Got to be honest with you, I'm running to get a phone charger right now. I missed it. <laughs> All right, so I'll talk. So um, I, I see a decent push, but he's really just kind of bent over at the waist. You're not seeing like a ton of horizontal power because he's not he's not able to project himself very far. So that's how I really can tell. He's only on, by his second step. He's only he's below two yards. By his third step, he's at he's at three, and his fourth step, he's before five yards. So he hasn't really projected much. So Miles is a guy that had super high velocity. So he had um, you know he was running about 22 miles per hour but his acceleration rate was kind of low. So he was somebody that we did more force-based training. So working on sleds and, and working on his peak power. 
Um, and his actual velocity never changed, but he PR by almost 0.3 seconds in his 40 because he, we worked on the acceleration rate. So technically, uh, sorry, physiologically, he was a velocity-based runner. Um, and then we moved his profile to more in the middle. Um, technically, what you see, somewhere to said, uh, the first run, you see that foot flick up. And by the time it hits the ground, it's not attacking back with any force. It's just kind of it's kind of stabbing the ground here. Okay, that's one, two, same thing. He's only producing force. So like look at the height between his foot and the ground. It's not a lot of time to hit the ground, not a lot of air time. So not he's not gonna produce a big punch into the ground that's gonna project him forward. It's just gonna kind of be a soft little tap. Soft little tap. So when it's soft like this, it's a longer contact time. It's gonna take him longer to get to his next step. Okay, then let's look at here. Crashing into the ground a little bit ahead of his body. And then you see his four step land completely flat. So not an efficient acceleration yet, um, although it does improve over time. If I can find his latest one, I'll show it to you. Okay, um, let's go to JJ Taylor. Dill, are you watching this? Yeah, by the third step, there was almost no attack back before the foot hit the ground. Yeah. Let the foot hang out there. Oh, 10%. Yeah, both of so, us. Yeah, it's all right. I got a charger. Um, but, okay, so JJ has an incredible ratio of force. Like, he is a five foot eight, 195 pound ball of muscle. Like, he was in the weight room. He could, he could squat. There's not a weight. In there, you couldn't squat if it, if it went on a bar. He's a freak. Um, but he's got not great velocity, high velocity potential. So you're not going to see a great max velocity. Um, and his acceleration rate is actually going to be super, super, super high. But his because his velocity is not high, it, you know, it's not going to equal out. So you'll see with the athlete, like JJ, running backs usually, he's like great ratio of force super high decrease in ratio of force. So their force is gonna go from horizontal to vertical quick, and they're gonna get up and they're gonna start running. So like a guy like this, you'll see get up to speed within two, three steps. So if you look at where his third step is, he actually decelerates on his third step a ton. Like watch it one more time. So he, his first step, beautiful, great initial push. This is where the weight room comes into play. Boom, great push, great push. Dud, dud, dud. You see him decelerating? He's already started his decel a little bit on that. Okay, so what, what a heavy sled would do would allow him to continue to put force similar to these first two steps like this. One, two. We want to keep that pattern for a little bit longer. That is a, both a technical and force-based um, ask these athletes okay now let's go to um let's see nick harris all these guys are in the nfl so they don't mind that i'm beating them up like this because they make enough money <laughs> but we're, uh the outcome of this talk doesn't isn't affecting them at all so all right let's watch nick What do you see, Dill? He continued it a lot better than JJ, at least the direction and the angle on three and four. Uh, I don't have the data. It looks on the slow-mo like he might almost be overdoing the airtime, but it's better than it's better than the approach JJ took. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Nick ended up being the fastest center at the combine. So he's uh, 306 pounds, so we're not going to tear him apart. But, yeah, he has a ton of stiffness. Like, he, uh, he gets a lot of air time, so he bounces high in the air. Um, but, like, if you think about demands of a lineman, um, they're taught to project upwards, like, from a lower stance. So they're used to practicing producing vertical force versus horizontal. So this is in the beginning, obviously, when we're testing him. And you see his force start to go vertical fast, and he feels more comfortable being more upright. So for him, it was about training him to produce force behind his center of gravity and continue that push for a little bit longer before his foot got all the way flat. So he's got a lot of balance, but you see here, it's almost like he's reaching for that step and really he just needs to be hitting back. So he needs to find a way to get back to the ground and hit hard to produce force behind him. So if you look at this angle here, this is where he wants to, to produce force, which is going to do that. It's going to make it vertical. Well, what we want him to do is come back this way to keep his body going out that way. All right. So it's just a little bit of a change. Um, that's, you know, heavy sled would, would do a lot of work with that. Um, let me, let me go to a good one. And on JJ's, not, not to kill your sled wave on JJ's, but that there's a lot of technical and understanding that will fix that real quick. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Like for him, it's, it's, He's got the power. He just needs to kind of like orient himself in a different, different way. Oh, that's not said. Austin, this is huddle technique. Huddle like the, the video app, H-U-D-L, but their technique app. Yeah, this this has all of our videos on it. Like it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of videos. So it's awesome for us. Uh that's Brandon Brooks. Okay. Here's a good one. So this is a good initial ratio of force. It's a good decrease in ratio of force. It's good technically, and he gets into velocity a little bit later in his run. So you can still, he's still accelerating. He's still accelerating. He's still accelerating. He's still accelerating. And by accelerating, I mean not staying low, but he's still climbing in velocity. This was a 4-3-1. Okay, so it's a great, I'll play, it, I'll play it in full speed, but it's a great climb. It's great ratios. He's still climbing in velocity, still climbing in velocity all the way through, through the end. I'll play it one more time. So remember, acceleration is everything leading up to the peak velocity. All right. Uh, Dale, did, you, did I cover everything? Or do you think there's uh, anything else you need to go over more on that? No, that last one was a great example of how the direction of the first three steps correlates to covering more ground even at the end of the 40. Like he set himself up for success. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think you, uh, think you covered it. Uh, I think you got one more question in the chat. Yeah, let's, let's run the questions up real quick. Because... Um, we're like 50 minutes in. So let's, let's run these questions up. Um, what would you do differently for an athlete who already has a high max horizontal force but needs to increase their V0? It's a good question. So light sleds. So still, still work on their horizontal force, of course. So they maintain that. Lighter sleds and more higher velocity runs. So um, you, you'd work on 
some flies with them. You, you let them build up to higher speeds. Um, you'd work on their stiffness, their foot ankle complex. So working on um, making sure that the force they create is transmitted through the ground. Um, optimal sled weight range, like let's say to make it simple, like 70 to 90, it's really 60 to 90, but for most athletes that you'll have, it's between 70 and 90% body weight um, on the sled. Let's see what else we got. Last week, you'd be able to find these videos. Yeah, so Sean, did you get, we sent an email out that had the past two uh, Zoom links in it. I don't know if you saw it though. Did Were you able to get that? Yeah, so on that invitation, it should have um, the previous two. If not, we'll send them, we'll send all of them out tonight also. So no worries. You guys got any other questions? Do you got any other questions or does it make sense to you? Todd, do you have any questions? <laughs> all good, Les. Awesome. Yeah, all right, good. guys. A lot. Yeah, I appreciate you guys for staying on. I thought it was going to be short. Oh, do I train running a high low? Oh, here, here they are. We'll take these two. So high low methodology. Um, yeah, definitely. Like we, we both Dylan and I kind of began this journey looking at Charlie Francis in terms of like program organization. So um, originally it was like a high low off, high low, maybe medium or off. Um, so high meaning like a high central nervous system component versus a low central nervous system component. So sprinting is a high nervous system component. Um, tempo runs or like lower velocity stuff is a low central nervous system component. So we were doing Monday, Thursday were our highs. Um, now we do a little bit more like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we do kind of a micro dose across the week versus high doses Monday, Thursday. But we use both depending on when and where during, during our off season. Um, how much do I focus on mobility, mobility and flexibility for speed training? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think we do focus a ton on that. So our warm ups, for sure, we focus on um, mobility and flexibility. Prehab is like a, is one where we take whatever people have individually they need to work on. We use that time to address those issues. So like if, for example, they need to work on hip inter internal rotation, like that's that's a big one. Or if they work on um, hip flexor lengthening, so like if they're in anterior pelvic tilt, it's because their hip flexors are tight and shortened, and their hamstrings are overstretched. So that might be build their posterior chain and stretch the hip flexors. That could be their prehab. Um, and then a warm up will kind of like warm everything up, get get to their ranges of motion they need for that for that day. And then post workout is when you do like more um, static holds or PNF stretching um, Wednesdays would be yoga. So yeah, that's like the other part of organization. And we can kind of, if you guys want next week, I can talk more about how to organize weeks and it's all in our app to be honest. Um, so yeah, we can definitely talk about that. All right. Any other questions? All right, guys, appreciate you. If you have anything, anything else comes up, just hit me. I'll, um, I'll be doing this again at six. If you guys want to hop back on, if you, if you didn't ask the question now, Oh, next week on programming. Okay, cool. I'll do that. I'll do that. All right, guys. Peace.